This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Undaunted North Africa. Undaunted North Africa was released in 2020 by Osprey Games and designed by Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson. This game supports two players and takes 45 to 60 minutes per scenario to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Undaunted North Africa is a deck-building war game pitting players against one another as either the British Army's long-range desert group or the Royal Italian Army in the North African theater of World War II. Across a series of missions, players must strive to claim, hold, or destroy key objectives. Gameplay unfolds on a modular battlefield of double-sided terrain tiles. Cards allow each side to seize the initiative, bolster their forces, or control their troops on the battlefield. Be aware though, every injury removes a card from the player's deck. Therefore, take charge amidst the chaos of desert warfare, outmaneuver the opposition across open sands and rocky terrain, and remain undaunted. The key to learning Undaunted North Africa is understanding how movement and combat actions in the board area are driven by card play in each player area. Let's begin by breaking down how the map, combat counters, and markers function in the board area while we set up the game. To teach Undaunted North Africa, I'm going to use Scenario 1. The setup information for this scenario can be found in the Scenario book starting on page 6. The board area contains the scenario's map, which is built from double-sided board tiles. Each board tile side is identified with an alphanumeric code signifying the tile number and a letter indicating the side. Osprey Games Scenario Book provides an excellent visual reference for each scenario's map setup. On page 7, there is an image of the completed Scenario 1 setup and a coded tile reference table at the bottom of the page. Breaking this setup down, first locate the required tiles and place them as shown in the setup guide. Next, scenarios may use several types of objective markers. These are brown flags with a strategic point value printed on them. There are also structure marker tiles that have these flags as well. In Undaunted North Africa, the LRDG are often tasked with destroying these structures and the Italian forces with controlling and protecting them. Each side has its own set of combat counters to represent its forces on the map. For the first scenario, the LRDG is represented by a scout, an engineer, and a gunner. Italian forces are comprised of a gunner, a scout, and a rifleman. Each combat counter type has a specific role in the game. Scouts unlock tile spaces for other combat counter movement. When a scout moves into a tile space, they place a counter printed with a binocular. This indicates that the space is scouted and allows that player's other combat counters to enter the tile space. Scenario 1 begins the game with each side having scouted three to four tile spaces. In Undaunted North Africa, each side has different objectives. The Italian forces need to control and defend objective areas to earn points. The LRDG often needs to destroy an objective structure to earn their points. Each side has specific combat counters to achieve these objectives. For the Italian player to control an objective, they need the Rifleman combat counter. When a Rifleman enters a tile space with an objective marker, they can take an action to control that space. Control is indicated by flipping over the binocular side of the marker to the national emblem printed on the control side. For the LRDG to destroy a structure tile, they need a unit with the demolition skill. In the first scenario, this is the engineer. Demolition is essentially an attack on the structure, which we will cover in the combat section of this tutorial. 
And with that, the board area is now set up for scenario one. Let's now talk about the card play that drives the action on the map in each player area. For scenario one, each site has a similar number of cards. Therefore, I'm only going to show the LRDG area. The Italian play area setup is generally the same. The reference for this setup is on page 6 of the scenario book. On the lower half of this page, you'll find two matching tables. Each table lists that side's cards in one column and a symbol for each card to use in the scenario. A black D icon means one of these card types is added to the player's deck. A white S icon indicates that one of these cards is placed in supply. Once players have gathered all the cards for their deck, shuffle them and place them face down in their deck play area. For the supply area, make a stack of cards for each type and place them face up. The final step is to place the initiative marker between the two players with the Italian emblem face up. The Italian player begins this scenario with the initiative. Now that you know how to set up the player areas, let's learn about the phases of gameplay. Each round of play is divided into three phases. In phase one, each player draws four cards from their decks. Then in phase two, they select one card from their hand to bid for initiative to see who takes the first turn. The card play with the highest initiative value wins. The Italian army begins this scenario with the initiative, so you skip this phase for the first round. Phase three is broken into two parts. In the first half, the player that won the initiative plays through their hand. They can play a card for its action or hunker down with that card and send it back to supply. If the scenario has vehicles, a card can be played for a combat counter to switch seats within that vehicle. Or, they can hold those cards until the end of their turn and then discard them with any Fog of War cards. Then in the second half, the player that lost the initiative plays through their hand. Once this has been completed, the round is over and the next round begins. This continues until a player has won the scenario. To illustrate Undaunted's various card statuses and play sequences, I've organized this tutorial's play area into specific card spaces to show key concepts. Once you're familiar with the rules, you can organize your own play area however you like. To understand the rationale behind this layout, let's first divide the player area roughly in half. Cards in the spaces above this line are inactive. In Undaunted North Africa, the supply space is a storage area to control the number of active cards in play. As you'll see in just a moment, the rules for this space differ greatly from the first game, Undaunted Normandy. Next to supply is the remove space. Imagine this space as the graveyard. Once cards are placed here, they can never come back to the game. Below the line is the active card area. Cards in these spaces are engaged in the scenario taking place on the map. At the beginning of Scenario 1, each combat counter has two of its cards assigned to this area. The unit's remaining combat cards are stacked face up in the supply space. Now, let's discuss how a soldier's combat counter is linked to the combat cards in the player area. In Undaunted North Africa, each combat counter represents a single soldier on the map. Each of that soldier's combat cards in the active play area equal a portion of its health and an opportunity to take an action. Players will need to manage the number of that soldier's combat cards between the supply area and the active play area to increase its overall health and actions. The big difference in Undaunted North Africa is that once all of a soldier's combat cards are removed from the active play area, the soldier is eliminated. That soldier's combat counter is removed from the map, and any combat cards in the supply area are also removed. Keep this major difference in mind if you're used to the rules for Undaunted Normandy. 
There are also cards in the player area that do not have combat counters on the map. Command cards represent an abstracted form of leadership, and Fog of War cards approximate the chaos and confusion of the battlefield. The active area has three card spaces. The deck represents the availability of combat forces, command leadership, and Fog of War elements. Every game round, players draw four cards from the deck to form their hand. The cards in a player's hand represent their military options for the turn. Combat cards can be played for actions to affect counters on the board. Command cards can be played for actions to change card status in the player area. For example, the bolster action moves cards from the supply area to the discard pile. Command allows the player to draw more cards from the deck, and the Inspire action allows a card to be played again. Fog of War cards cannot be played for anything but weak bids for initiative. They essentially reduce the number of viable card options a player has every turn. If a player does not wish to take a card action, they can also hunker down, which sends that card back to the supply area. With this method, a player can control the amount of health and number of actions a soldier can take, and manage the size of their deck to control the flow of cards. Be aware though, Hunker Down does not work with Fog of War cards. Played cards, and anything remaining in the player's hand at the end of their turn, are moved to the discard pile. When all cards from the deck have been drawn, these discards are shuffled into a new deck. Another gameplay mechanic to discuss here is how Fog of War cards impact command. When a scout combat counter enters a new tile and places a binocular counter, it expands that nation's troop range, but also increases the likelihood of communication breakdown. To reflect this in gameplay, with placement of every new binocular counter, the player also takes a Fog of War card and places it in their discard pile. From here, Fog of War cards will circulate into a new deck shuffle and eventually end up in the player's hand. Fog of War cards can't be played for anything except a weak initiative bid. At the end of the player's turn, Fog of War cards are placed in the discard pile until they recirculate and pop up again. The only way to purge a Fog of War card is when it is in the player's hand and a scout card is played for its recon action, which then sends the Fog of War card to the removed area. Now that we better understand the flow of cards in the player area, let's learn more about the various roles in the game and their game pieces. Let's discuss the game pieces for the first scenario. Combat counters identify soldiers on the game board. Each combat counter is double-sided with a ready side and a suppressed side. Suppression is a combat effect of heavy machine gun fire. While suppressed, a soldier cannot take actions until their counter has been flipped back to its ready side. This can be accomplished by playing one of the soldier's combat cards to remove the suppression. Combat counter layout is simple. In the center of each counter is the unit's title. Below this is a shield that indicates the unit's base defense for combat. Some combat counters will have a squad designation. This organizes multiple combat counters of the same type as A, B, or C. Each combat counter is linked to combat cards in the play area. For example, this scout combat counter is linked to four scout combat cards. Each of these combat cards represents a portion of its health. The name and unique portrait are meant to add flavor to the game. Below the card's title are the various actions that can be taken when the card is played. Combat cards also have an initiative value, which can be bid to win initiative at the beginning of a new game round. A scout combat card can be played from the player's hand to conduct one of four actions. Scout allows the combat counter to move up to two tile spaces on the map. Unscouted tile spaces receive a binocular token and require the player to draw a Fog of War card and place it in their discard space. 
Attack allows the scout to engage in combat with an enemy combat counter on the board using one ten-sided die. I will cover combat for the first scenario later in this episode. Recon can be played if the player also has a Fog of War card in their hand. This removes the Fog of War card from the game and allows the player to draw another card from their deck and place it immediately in their hand. And finally, Conceal, which means that the player can take one Fog of War from their opponent's supply area and place it in their discard area. Rifleman units share the same counter and card layout. However, they have different actions and gameplay values. All of this supports the Rifleman unit's role in controlling and holding objective tile spaces. Let's take a moment to discuss the Rifleman's actions. The Rifleman Combat card has three actions. The Move action allows the Rifleman Combat counter to be moved one tile space but only if that tile space has been scouted. The attack action allows the Rifleman combat counter to conduct combat against an enemy combat counter with one die. We'll discuss how to resolve an attack a little later in this episode. And finally, the control action allows a Rifleman combat counter to flip a binocular counter over to its control side, thus controlling a tile with an objective marker for points. Next, let's discuss Machine Gunners. These units have more attack and defense capabilities than Riflemen, and they can also lay down suppressive firepower as well. The Suppress action is conducted like an attack action. The difference is that Suppression does not inflict casualties. Instead, it flips a combat counter over and prevents it from taking any actions. To return a combat counter to its ready side, the owner must play a combat card from that unit for an action, but then don't take the action. Be aware though, while suppressed, combat cards in the unit can be hunkered down to return them to supply, but this does not remove suppression. The machine gunner also has the repair ability. This allows him to remove a damage marker from a vehicle that is in the same tile. If inside the vehicle, they can only repair that vehicle. If the vehicle was disabled and there are now fewer damage markers than the number shown on its critical threshold, flip the vehicle to its ready side. Please note, you cannot repair a destroyed vehicle. A unique role to the LRDG is the engineer. This is a highly skilled individual that is critical in the first mission because he possesses the demolition ability. Demolition allows the engineer to destroy objective structures and earn points. Demolition is conducted using the game's combat rules, which we will cover shortly. The engineer also has a repair action that allows him to remove damage markers from vehicles using the same rule set as machine gunners. Command cards represent commission officers and NCOs. The influence of these leadership roles are abstracted in the card play and they do not have combat counters. These cards can easily be differentiated from combat cards by the command stars next to their actions. Command cards also have the highest initiative values in the game and can be spent as strong bids for initiative. However, while doing so, players lose their powerful actions for card management. Therefore, strategize your use of command cards carefully. Next, let's take a look at the available actions for the command cards in Scenario 1. The Platoon Sergeant Command card has two actions. Bolster allows up to three cards to be moved from Supply to the Discard Pile. The Platoon Sergeant's Command action allows up to two cards from the deck to be added to the player's hand. Those cards can be played as normal during that turn. The LRDG player also has a Warrant Officer in Scenario 1. He has a two-card Bolster action. They also have an Inspire action, which allows the player to draw a card from their play area and add them back to their hand. This card can be played as normal during the turn. As we discussed earlier, Fog of War cards represent the breakdown in communications caused by the expansion of a player's platoon across the map. 
Whenever a scout marker enters a new tile space and places down a control marker on its binocular side, the player must draw a Fog of War card from their supply and place it in their discard area. Once a Fog of War card enters the active play area, they circulate through a player's cards. And they can only be removed from this cycle by a Scout Recon action if both cards are in the same hand. Next, let's learn about the game's combat. In Undaunted, combat is simple. All of the game's combat actions use the same basic attack calculation. To initiate combat, a combat card is played for its attack action. Next, the player declares a target. It can be anywhere on the map. Undaunted does not have line of sight restrictions. To resolve the attack, the player adds together three numbers. The first number is in a shield on the target's combat counter. This is the combat counter's base defense. Next, add the shield number in the target's tile. This is the terrain's cover bonus. Some terrain also has a white shield with a number. White shields indicate that the tile terrain has elevation, like a hill. If the attacker's terrain has a white shield, and the target's terrain has a white shield, then you use the target terrain's white shield number. This means that the attacker and the target are at the same elevation. Put simply, if both terrain tiles do not have a white shield, then use the black shield. Finally, count the number of tiles from the attacker to the target, not including the attacker's tile. This is known as the target's range bonus. Total these three numbers to determine the target's total defense value. This is the number that the attacker must meet or beat with a die roll. The attacker will then roll their attack dice. The number of dice the attacker rolls is printed next to the attack action on the combat card. If any of the dice show a number equal to or greater than the defender's total defense value, the attack is successful. The number of dice that are successful does not matter. A die result of 10 is always successful, no matter how high the defender's total defense value is. When an attack is successful, the targeted player must find a card from the attack combat counters unit and remove it from the game. Finding and removing a combat card as a casualty follows a specific sequence. From our example, let's say that the rifleman scored a hit. And now the LRDG player must find a scout combat card in the active play area. Combat cards are checked for and removed from the active play area in the following sequence. First, the player checks their hand for the card. If they don't find it there, next they check their discard pile. And if it's not there, they should find it in their deck. When they remove the card, they then reshuffle the deck. That eliminated combat card is then placed in the remove space. After that, if the combat counter is hit in a subsequent attack and none of its cards are in the active play area, then that soldier is eliminated. Remove the combat counter from the map and any remaining combat cards for this soldier from the supply area. With an attack action, this is how players resolve a successful hit. The Suppress action uses the same system except instead of removing a combat card, the combat counter that is hit is flipped over to its Suppress side. Next, let's discuss Demolition Combat against a structure. In the first scenario, the LRDG scores objective points by blowing up Italian structures. The LRDG player accomplishes this by using their engineer's demolition action. To conduct this action, the engineer must be in the same tile space as the structure. Demolition follows the same combat calculation as before with some exclusions. First, take the structure's base defense from the shield icon on the structure tile. There is no cover bonus for demolition, and there is no range bonus since the engineer needs to be in the same tile space as the structure. So basically, you just use the base defense for the total defense value. Next, it's time for the LRDG player to roll dice. There are two circles next to the demolition action on the engineer card. 
The first black circle shows the number of dice to roll versus structures, and the second white circle versus armor. If any die result equals or exceeds the total defense value, then the structure is destroyed. If the demolition is successful, the LRDG player removes the structure tile from the map and places it in front of them. They earn the points printed on the tile's objective marker. And those are the combat options for the first scenario. Next, let's review the victory conditions for the first scenario. Let's look at the victory conditions for Scenario 1, Landing Ground 7. To win Scenario 1 is for either side to claim three objective points. The LRDG does this by destroying structures, and the Italians do this by controlling structures. The game can also essentially be won if the Italian player eliminates the LRDG's engineer. Without the engineer, the LRDG cannot blow up structures and earn objective points. Now that we've covered these basic rules, you should be ready to play Scenario 1, and once you've mastered playing that scenario, check back to the Harsh Rules channel for the second episode in this series, where we will discuss units that arrive in later scenarios for more advanced undaunted gameplay. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.